Thank you for watching CTR TV. I'm Christy Oles. We have our capital conversation today with the first woman to lead the Republican caucus in the State House of Representatives, State Representative Themis Claritus. You represent Derby, Woodbridge, and Orange. And as I mentioned, first woman to hold that position. What does that distinction mean to you? Well, I, as I've said before, I don't want to be known for that. Um, I don't want to be the leader for that, but I'm very proud to be the first woman to lead the House Republican Caucus. I think it's um, a little crazy that we didn't have a woman leader until 2014. Um, I'm also the only woman leader of all the leaders right now, so we sit in these uh, leadership meetings with the governor and all men and myself. Nancy Wyman is in there sometimes, so at least she, she neutralizes it a little bit. But it's interesting. It's an interesting dynamic. It's something I'm very proud of, and I, I think it's really helpful to especially young women who see, who, who walk up to the Capitol and they see all these stiff white men in suits and then they see somebody that's different. And so I, I think it, it really empowers people to, to realize you're who you are and you should be who you are. It um, doesn't matter how you look or where you're from or where you went to school. Okay, you've been in the legislature now for 20 years. You're in your 10th term. You mentioned it seemed, it's been an interesting time. What stands out among those 20 years? There are so many things that, that stand out. I wouldn't even know where to begin. I mean, but I will say in the past three years since I've been leader, the state's fiscal situation has gotten so bad. So we have been, and it, it is really like being in session year round all the time. We started session this year, technically the first week of February. And in my opening remarks on the floor, I said, this isn't the first day of, of session. This is month 14 of the last session because we didn't have a budget till November. Uh, we were negotiating budgets all year long. As leaders, we were there most every day. Um, right, I will say right now, the thing that I'm most proud of is we passed a Republican and minority party budget in September, which we're trying to, we're still doing some research, but we think it's the first time it's happened in the country. Um, and we couldn't have done it without five Democrat votes in the House, so we're just so proud that it was bipartisan in that way. Uh, and things have changed in the past past two years, the, the numbers in the House and the Senate, meaning the ratio of Republicans to Democrats, is tied in the Senate and it's four votes away in the House. And that has changed the entire dynamic of the legislature and I believe for the better. Obviously you were there when the Republican caucus hit a low of 37 members. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that now you're four votes shy of having a split. How has that changed and how has that kind of dictated the way you do your job? First of all, it's forced the governor and the Democrats in the House and the Senate to be open-minded to everyone's ideas. I mean, it's easy to say, of course we're listening to everyone's ideas, but then do what you want to do. And that's really how it's been all these years. I mean, they have been in control of the House and the Senate for almost 40 years. There was one, one term in the 80s uh, for the House and one term in the 90s for the Senate where the Republicans were in control. But when you think about that, that you hear the governor talk about 20 years of Republican governors, but he, I always say he ends that uh, with a comma instead of a period because he should say after that, and 40 years of Democrat-controlled legislatures. And this isn't, you know, to say, I have lots of friends on the other side of the aisle, so, and we all get along very well and work as best as we can together. But the reality is when you have so many extra senators and so many extra uh, representatives, on your side in your party. It's very easy to say I'm listening to everybody, but actually to sit down and have to listen in regards to making your decisions in a bipartisan way are very different. Um, when you know you have that wiggle room, you can do almost anything you want, and I think that that's hurt the state of Connecticut. This is a big election year. All the state legislators are up for election. Is there hope or optimism that the Republicans could possibly gain the majority? Well, I mean, that's our plan. That's our plan. We're working very hard uh, towards that goal. I do know one thing, whether you're at the gym or in a coffee shop or at the gas station or in the supermarket, uh, we know the unpopularity of the governor, but people are starting to realize that the governor can't do anything. Any governor can't do anything on his own. Uh, he's got to have the acquiescence of the legislature. And all these years when the governors made these very terrible decisions, the two highest tax increases in the state's history, the highest borrowing we've ever had, every anti-business bill known to man, people blame the governor because that's the figurehead. Uh, and he certainly has, there's plenty of blame to go in his direction. But they have, people have to understand that 
you must, if you believe that the governor's done a bad job, you must also blame the people that have been in control of the House and Senate, which have been the Democratic Party, because they have let him do it. You can't, we have this great thing called separation of powers and separate and equal branches of government. And if you, you're, we're not a communist country, which is the wonderful thing about where we live, but a governor can't do anything without the House and Senate allowing him to do so. Let's talk about the governor's race for a little bit. There were supporters who were probably urging you to jump into that race. It's a very crowded field, but earlier this year you announced you're going to seek re-election in the House. What played into that decision and why not run for the state's highest position? Well, that was one of the most torturous decisions I'd ever made. I tortured myself on a daily basis and all my family and all my friends. And the reason it was so difficult is because, first of all, I was so, I was so honored that people felt so strongly about me running. And I did want to run. But I also wanted to see this job that I have through because I know one thing. I know if we have a Republican governor, if we don't have control of at least the House or the Senate, ideally both, but at least one, that Republican governor will not be able to do the job that he or she needs to do because this state is in very bad shape. And it is not going to take cutting around the edges like we've seen the majority do year after year in the governor. It's going to take very bold, very decisive, very difficult decisions on a governor's part which will need a House and a Senate to go along with he or she. And so although I was very interested in running for governor and I would have loved to have been able to bring my ideas forward to the state in that way, I knew that unless we have a majority in the House and Senate that governor is not going to be able to do anything. So I made the difficult decision to stay. I'm really proud of what we've done in the House Republican Caucus. I, I love um, all my colleagues and, and we, we operate as a team and a family and that's why we get so much done. Let's talk about the bold decisions that may need to be made by the next governor. The state's fiscal commission, uh, fiscal growth, fiscal stability and economic growth released its report recently. They looked at ways to improve the state for families and businesses and came out with their recommendations. Ten key recommendations from what they say there's something in there for everybody to like and something in there for everybody to not like. What is your initial view of that report? Well, first, um, as a supporter of, of putting that commission together, I want to thank everybody who gave their time. I mean, these are business owners, uh, retired uh, business people, people that are very involved, realtors, um, and people who know what's going on in the state and who have seen what's going on, and, and people who have helped their own businesses grow and develop. And so they gave of their time, which we were very very pleased with and thankful for. And they're right, there are things we love and there are things we hate, but the, the key part of that rec those recommendations is that it must go as a whole. Now, if that goes forward in, in bits and pieces, it, it, you might as well just say the commission never existed. Because it's very easy to say, okay, um, let's change collective bargaining. It's very easy to say, let's raise the minimum wage. It's very easy to say, if you at look at all the bits and pieces that make up the whole, but if we don't do these things together, if we don't do them, um, it will not change the structure of the state of Connecticut. And it's difficult, and we're planning on having a hearing next week. So I think that'll be very interesting to hear people have to say about it and, and, and dig deep and drill down and ask the questions that need to be asked. But that should rise or fall on its own as a whole. I was going to ask, the fact that they did make a very strong point that this is linked together. It is a comprehensive package that should be taken as a whole. What impact do you think that'll have on its future, on whether it moves forward, on whether it can be something that is put into practice? Well, I think uh, that will tell you who really wants to make a change in the state of Connecticut, who really has a vision. I mean, you cannot, um, you cannot fund transportation, for example, without cutting spending on the other end. You cannot um, cut programs without downsizing government. I mean, one, they go hand in hand. So with the high taxes we have, with the high borrowing we have, with, with the transportation issues we have, I mean, just to name a few, you can't do one without the other because that's how the state got in this mess. That's how the state got in this mess. It's been pushing things forward, uh, that phrase that I hate, kicking the can down the road, and just fixing a little bit at a time because nobody had the courage and the backbone to make the difficult decisions because everybody worries about their next election. And although that's, we can't, I can't help the state unless I'm in office, but we have to figure out, this state is, is in very bad shape. And if we don't make those very difficult decisions, and that means doing some things we don't like. I mean, some of their proposals 
raise taxes, but some of their proposals lower taxes. And at the end of the day, th that is, there, is no there is no additional tax to any person. In fact, most people, uh, in fact, I think almost everybody, will have a net tax uh, reduction. You know, whether it's a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars. So it's a restructuring, and that's what needs to be done in this state, whether it's taxes, transportation, et cetera. We need to restructure what we're doing, and we use that word structural changes all the time. But it's not about stopping something, it's about changing it for the future. Have you decided where you're going to fall on this or where you're going to stand on this? No, we're still, uh, actually the commission came mm -hmm. before, uh, the chairman of the commission came to our caucus the other day um, to start that process of discussing it so people had, had questions about it and so we're moving down that road. We want to know everything we can about it before we make a decision. Of course. This is a short legislative session. Deadlines are already coming up for a number of the committees. What do you see for the rest of the session happening? Well, we end the beginning of May and we still have a, a budget deficit and we are planning on, on fixing that budget deficit um, in the House and Senate Republican caucuses. We, we have what we call consensus revenue numbers that come out several times per year. The next time they're coming out is the end of April. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to wait till those numbers come out. We believe that we have to take action before that. Uh, there's a as you said, in the committees, there's a lot of deadlines coming up, so all the bills are, are going through in the next week or two. So we'll see where that goes. But clearly, I mean, as important as individual bills are, the one most important thing that everybody is looking at and what we work on every day is the state budget. Last year's budget talks obviously stretched into October. The, some of the final ideas that were floated around as part of that were an increase in the conveyance tax and also a tax on second homes and investment properties. They didn't make it into the final proposal. The governor brought back the increase in the conveyance tax in his proposal this year. Do you see support for either of those as we get closer to making those budget adjustments? Well, the reason they didn't make it through the bu into the budget last year is because we, we stood firm that that was not a way to move the state forward. and and I have all faith that we will feel, be in the same position this year. I mean, just the, the example of a tax on a second home. People, some people would look at that and say, well, if people have enough money to have a second home, they, they shouldn't be complaining about the tax. It's not just, I mean, people envision this, you know, I have a home on the beach and, you know, and I'm lounging having a, having a lemonade. That's not what it's about. It's even if you buy a home to fix up and, you, and sell it, you know, and flip it and, um, or rent it out, uh, even those homes would be taxed. So it, it was much broader than they even anticipated because they didn't look into it as much as they could. I mean, it was an issue of out-of-state homes versus in-state homes. It wasn't even written properly. Uh, but whether it was or it wasn't, it's, it's, that is not something that will make people stay in Connecticut and just as importantly have people move into Connecticut. We talked a little bit about the bipartisanship that finally came about late last year. Do you see that continuing so far this session? So we, we have plenty of bipartisanship. We do bills together. If you look at the bills that are voted on in the legislature, over 90% of them are in a bipartisan way. But we have to face facts. This is a very tough time. And our philosophies and our visions in the Republican and the Democrat caucuses are different. They are. It's not good or bad. I mean, we believe that their philosophies have gotten us in this mess. So we believe they're bad. And we will fight to the end and further to make sure that they do not continue as, as the conveyance tax and the second home tax is an example. Kind of a broad question, but what is your vision for Connecticut and how do we get there? Vision for Connecticut, I mean, it's pretty simple. I want to make people that are here be able to afford being here, be able to afford their home, afford to send their kids to school. I want those kids to be able to, when they go to school, whether it be here or out of state, be able to come back because they can afford a home, because they can raise a family, because people can retire here. Those are the basic things people want. And we've seen people leave one after one because they can't do those basic things. And when we go back to those structural changes, it's about the fact that Connecticut is too expensive to live. People there are not the jobs that were around so people can have those jobs. The jobs that are coming in are lower wage jobs uh, they're being replaced with. And so it is the structure of the state of Connecticut that we have the problem with. And it is improving our transportation, but in an affordable way. You grew up in Seymour. You still live in that area, that region. Why, what drives you back there? Why stay in that part of the state? Well, my family's there, and family's more, most important to me. So the Woodbridge, Orange, the Valley area is very, um, it's very family-oriented. 
it's, it's a close-knit community. People are very loyal and people are very um, caring and loving. And it's, it's nice that I, I had the ability to grow up in a place like that. So let's talk about your family. Your younger sister is now serving her first term in the State House. You guys are the first sisters to serve at the same time in the General Assembly. What's it been like having her there? Did you walk her through or did you kind of let her learn it on her own? Well, we're very close, so <laughs> she, you know, she knows a lot about what goes on because she unfortunately had to hear it from me every mm -hmm. day. I mean, I was excited. I mean, for me, it was, it was more like I just want to win a seat. <laughs> I mean, as leader, You're I looking wanted, at the numbers. I want, exactly, and it was a number, but I was thrilled that she was doing it, but I, I don't think I realized how much I would like it until she got there. I mean, it's nice knowing that in, that, in a cutthroat world like politics, that even though I have great friends up there, uh, to have somebody that's your family right behind you. You obviously enjoy what you do. Most of the time. I certainly have my moments. I'm just, I do. I mean, when I go to sleep at night, I, I know that I'm, I am helping the state of Connecticut and the people in the place that I love. And um, when you have those stressful moments, that's when you rely on your family and your friends. And luckily you have your sister right there with you. Exactly. Representative Claritas, thank you for joining us here on CTR thank TV, you. our Capital Conversation. And thank you for watching as well.